Thank you very much for that very kind introduction, and my thanks as well to Ken and Bruce for their generous support of the center. Now, this is an important opportunity for us as academics. We study things, examine things, look at patterns, but often the truest sense of confirmation comes from the practitioners in the room. We tell you about the strategy, what we found, and if you're either nodding or falling asleep, we've probably got it right. This is joint work with my colleagues Robbie Musawi, Mike Pagano, John Sedono from Villanova University. And we're going to look at short about short selling, short interest, and failing to deliver an ETFs. Those are high levels, as a brief overview of the paper, of short interest and FTDs for ETFs, which I think initially when I looked at the data just assumed was naked short selling. We think the explanation behind that is much more complicated and interesting for that matter. But what motivates our study and most of these academic studies on ETFs are the incredible adoption of this as a financial product. Worldwide, at the end of 2017, we had almost $5 trillion invested in ETF products, the majority of those in US, financial ET US ETF products. So you can see the decomposition across the different categories here. As a comparison point, worldwide open-ended mutual funds at 2017 had about 27 trillion in assets. We're talking about 15, 16% market share. Now, it's not just the dollar amount which is staggering, it's also the rate of adoption. If we look at flows worldwide into ETFs here by category again, from 2008 to 2017, there was about two trillion that flowed into uh, equity funds, so net inflows into equity funds. Compare that to open-ended fund equity funds, it was only about half a trillion. And the point for me, which is maybe most striking, I think about adoption of this new financial innovation. Uh, index funds, the first Vanguard index fund was launched in 1976. It took about 30 years for index funds to get 10% market share. For ETFs, it took about seven years to get to that 10% market share number. So this is a product that has been widely adopted and widely used, and for good reason. You can go long, you can go short, you can hold it long-term, short-term, there's levered versions of it. So there's lots of reasons why both retail and institutional traders have embraced ETS. Now, as an academic, I'm a natural skeptic, and so when everybody likes something, I ask the question, well, should I be concerned? This rapid adoption of this instrument over a period of relatively good markets might mean that, you know, the bottom has not yet fallen out. Now, I'm not going to say that that's true here, but I will point out the characteristics of ETFs that make us consider Dean Garrett's charge to think about what might play a role in the next crash. So what would those be? Well, number one, they're a growing force. Five trillion in assets worldwide and growing quickly. In addition to that, they constitute a disproportionate percentage of trading volume. So over our sample period, Use it looking at U.S. ETF products, they're about 5% on average of market cap and yet constitute up, you know, upwards of 25% of trading volume. They're a hybrid, this mutual fund that also has you know, individual stock-like properties. And underlying that hybrid structure is this very unique and innovative liquidity provision mechanism. We have these authorized participants who are looking at imbalances in the supply and demand of these and arbitraging the difference to provide liquidity when it's necessary. Now, that, that in and of itself, that mechanism is truly innovative. At the same time, those same authorized participants are the nexus of many markets. Spot, futures, options, security, lending. They might be making markets and ETFs across different asset classes, geographies, industries. So when we think about a possible contributor to a future crisis, we look for points of linkages, and this is a point of linkage across many different asset classes, industries, geographies, and even different types of investors. So the big question we'd really like to answer is, does the increased investment in and trading of ETFs pose a risk for the market? That's a huge question. I will not, unfortunately, answer that question today. However, I will point to one aspect of these ETFs that is concerning to me and point out a, a nuance to how markets are made, this underlying innovative liquidity mechanism for ETFs that I think we should at least be aware of. I think for those of you who are quant practitioners, it has implications for how you use ETF trading, returns, et cetera, as signals possibly in your model. And I think for those of you who worry about regulatory issues, there's some aspects of this nuanced mechanism that have implications for financial stability, as it were. Okay, now, 
When we started this paper, uh, we began by looking at a figure much like this. Here I've got common stock fails to deliver in dollar terms. That's indexed on the y-axis here from 2004 to 2018. So the blue line here is common stocks. The red dash are exchange traded funds. Now, part of what you see here, this big spike in 2008, is, a is related to a paper that uh, Chris actually and Adam and another Wharton professor, David Musto, and I wrote a while back. It turned out that market makers or people who purported to be market makers had an exemption to fail to deliver. Now, what, what is a fail? As it's described at the top here, it's a condition where two investors agree upon a transaction. They transact at time T, and then over our sample period with uh, T plus three clearing, they don't actually deliver the security at T plus three like they're supposed to, so they owe that security. Now, that exemption was allowed for market makers in order to enable liquidity to flow through to the markets, but the paper we published suggested that there were some people abusing that exemption who were doing this failing to deliver not to provide liquidity, but rather to gain access to short position. If I can't borrow the shares from somebody else, why not transact from somebody, not deliver the shares, and effectively I now have short exposure. I owe the share to somebody else. Now, the SEC took that to heart. In uh, the end there of 2008, early 2009, they passed the temporary version of SEC Rule 204, which became later the permanent version of SEC Rule 204 with some slight modifications. And you can see it had the desired effect. Dramatic decline in failing to deliver at that point in time. Now, before I had only looked at the blue line and saw that looked pretty constant, more or less, for stocks over time. But the first time I looked at this graph and I saw this increase in exchange traded funds, I thought, huh, maybe there's naked short selling of ETFs. Right? Lots of reasons you'd want short exposure via an ETF to an asset class, an industry, a geography, as it were. Over the same time period, you could say, well, ETFs were growing. Maybe that increase in the amount of failing in ETFs is simply uh, that growth of ETFs. But if we look at two things, either the dollar amount, which I have highlighted here, or the percentage of shares outstanding, you can see that while stocks, you know, it remains at about 2.02% of shares outstanding, we still consistently have 1% or so of ETF shares that are failing to deliver at any given point in time. And if we look at the actual dollar amount of fails, as of the end of our sample period, ETFs constituted 78% of the dollar volume of fails. And so all of this, once again, just confirmed my initial hypothesis. This is probably naked short selling. They have a desire to do it. There's tons of fails in these things. People just, you know, instead of paying the borrow rate or can't locate the shares, they're failing to deliver. So the next place we looked was short interest and said, well, okay, we should also see lots of short selling. Short interest should be high for these particular securities, and indeed that's the case. Over our sample period from 2004 to 2016, ETFs represented about 5% of market capitalization, and yet, as you can tell from that dotted red line indexed on the right-hand side of the graph, they constituted about 20% or so of short interest over that same time period. I wish I could say it was naked short selling, this paper would have been finished and published about two years ago if it was. But this is where we began our journey down the rabbit hole to figure out what was really going on. And to understand that journey, we have to start with a simple understanding of what happens behind this liquidity provision mechanism for authorized participants. My guess is there's many people in the room who understand that, in which case you can fall asleep for the next couple of slides. But for those who don't, I want to show you an example using what I like to call the Twinkie arbitrage. Okay, now what is the Twinkie arbitrage? I was the youngest of eight kids growing up. We lived in an upper middle class neighborhood, but having eight kids, we had no money, so we were not upper middle class. So I went to elementary school with these kids whose parents were very focused on their health and the health of their lunches. So they came to school with carrots, with hummus, with celery, with uh, wheat bread, but nothing that an eight-year-old actually wants to eat. And so I recognized there was an opportunity here, and so I, being the enterprising young man that I was, I would go and buy various sorts of treats, in this case, Twinkies, and for $3 a box of 10, I could get those Twinkies, I could take them to school where they could be sold for 50 cents a Twinkie. Okay, so I found an arbitrage. I have a cheap asset, it's the box. I can open the box, sell the individual components, that's the expensive asset, I can make the difference, right? What strategy? Buy the box, open the box, sell the individual Twinkies, what should the profit be? $3 to pay for it, $10, you know, 10 of these 50 cents, 
It turns out that wasn't really the profit. There was sometimes some inventory loss along the way. <laughs> so you, you can't really do this without testing the product to make sure you've got this. So yeah, fair enough, right? OK. Now, let's imagine a world where there are a bunch of people who copied this strategy. There's a glut of Twinkies in the elementary school lunch market. So price drive driven down to 10 cents a Twinkie. In theory, I could go back the other direction, right? Buy 10 Twinkies at 10 cents, put them back into the box, very carefully glue that box together, return it to the store for my $3, and the arbitrage could work the other way. Okay, now this is ridiculous, I get it. At the same time, this is exactly what an authorized participant does. The ETF itself, in this case SPY, is the box, and what's in that box are this basket of securities, the, the stocks and the proportionate amounts of the S&P 500. So, in this case, and these prices are old, I think SPY is at 285 or something today, but when I had written this presentation, it was 215.57, the basket NAV, so that's the price of the ETF itself at which you and I would buy and sell. The NAV is the value-weighted price of the components is 217, right? So what's the strategy? Well, the box is cheap, the components are expensive, so what do I do? I'm going to buy the ETF, open it up, take the component securities and sell them, and in theory, this is what my profit ought to be. Now, it's not quite that simple because I can't do this for a single ETF. I've got to do it for a basket of them. And how many of them? Well, a creation unit size, the median in our sample is 50,000 shares, right? So I do it in blocks of 50,000 for most ETFs, up to 200,000 for certain ETFs. In addition, there's a creation fee. Every time I do this transaction, either create new shares of the ETF by buying the underlying basket or, or, or the other direction, buying the ETFs and then opening the basket, it's going to be, uh, the median in our sample is $500. Now, it's more than those two things. It's also the trading cost. As I start to purchase the ETF shares, if it's less liquid, I'm driving that price up. And as I open the box and sell the components, I'm driving that price down. Right? So all these things have to be taken into account to assess what the profit is of the authorized participant. So this is how I would teach it to my MBA students. So look, this is what happens. In particular, ETF premium. If there's excess demand for the shares of the ETF, what happens? Well, the authorized participant goes and buys the underlying basket, delivers it to the sponsor who gives them these shares, then they sell the ETF shares in the market. Right? And that was a reasonable way to understand this. It turns out that's not actually how it works. So how does it work? Well, you've got two options. The first option is that. The second option is just to sell the ETF shares and then, because of this unique exemption, they have up until T plus 6 to actually create the shares they've just sold. So I sell you an ETF share in the case of excess demand. You've got it, but if I don't give it to you by T plus 3, there's technically a fail, but I'm actually allowed to not deliver it to you until T plus 6. Now, why is that done? Well, it's to enhance liquidity in the market, and we'll test as to whether or not it does. So spoiler alert, it does. It improves liquidity, this exemption. So it had its intended effects, but we'll also talk about some possible unintended effects as well. We're going to need to measure this activity, the selling an ETF when there's excess demand and not creating it. So we've proposed a measure called operational shorting. And to give you a sense of what that looks like, um, here's the definition from two different sources. So when we first identified this, we thought, is this what's really going on? And we had a hard time getting APs to talk to us about it. And then I stumbled across Jim McTagg's article here where he says, yes, this is exactly what's happening. Market makers, often commercial banks or hedge funds, create ETFs for their issuers by buying the securities that the funds are supposed to represent. But they've discovered they can make a predictable return, and I'd argue with that word predictable, but... Um, a return by delaying purchases and selling you non-existent exchange-traded fund shares that they will create later. Okay, now, you might think, well, Jim is antagonistic, possibly, so you can find similar fessing up, as it were, from the Investment Company Institute, right? This is the lobby arm of the asset management, at least the open-ended and ETF providers of the asset management industry, and they admit as well, right? They have this option to delay delivery past T plus 3, which technically would result in a fail. Here's our measure in an example. So here we're going to use the iShares core S&P total U.S. stock market ETF, and you've indexed it from January of 2012 until December of 2012. So we have the number of shares of the ETF uh, that we're going to measure here on the left-hand side, the percentage of shares outstanding on the right-hand side, and what do we see? 
The first line here, the blue one, is a cumulative buy-sell imbalance. It tells you whether there's excess buying or selling pressure in the market. Think of this as retail investors in that secondary market showing up and buying the shares. We're going to compare that to the actual change in the shares outstanding of the ETF. If there's creation or redemption activity, it won't appear in that blue line. It'll appear in the orange line that's right next to it. Now, the two of them mimic one another largely, right? It seems they respond. But often, the orange line lags the blue line a little bit. So that would be a case where you've sold and have not yet created for some period of time. Well, why is it that these don't overlap perfectly? Or, and how do we think this relates? Well, if I also overlay the fails to deliver as a percentage of shares outstanding, that's indexed on the right-hand side, you can see from these gray bars, when do I have a spike in fails when the buy-sell imbalance has gotten out of whack relative to the underlying shares being created? Right? I don't deliver at T plus 3, and so all of a sudden I've got a bunch of fails in this particular ETF. Now, why don't they match perfectly? Well, it goes back to that example of what the AP does. They've got a creation unit size and fee, so I've got to wait till I have an imbalance of 50,000 shares before I do this. I'm going to pay $500, which is not negligible relative to the value of that basket. And the trading cost or trading environment may also encourage me to delay creation of those ETF shares because I think conditions might improve. You know, the trade reverses, liquidity gets better, whatever it might be. So we see periods of persistent operational shorting, and sure enough, we see increased fails to deliver associated with those. So that, in pictorial form, is our measure. Here's what the measure looks like. Now, that was an example across an entire year. We're only going to be looking at three-day windows rolling forward. So we look specifically at that buy, sell, and balance for three days, and then compare it to the decision of whether or not the evening of T minus 1, which would appear the morning of time T, do I create those shares or not? This measure, operational shorting, will turn on when I have delayed creation, but it will be zero if I haven't delayed creation or if there's excess selling pressure as well. We're only picking up conditions where the market is bullish about, this ETF, uh, about these ETFs. So what do we want to do with this? Well, we're going to determine, first of all, the, we're going to look at the determinants of the AP's decision to operationally short. These will not surprise you, but they're a way to test whether or not we're picking up what we think we're picking up with this mechanism. We're going to look at whether or not these operational shorting contributes to the observed high rates of ETF short interest and FTDs. And that one example, it looked like it, but more systematically, are the high rates of short interest and failing to deliver related in some material way to this measure of operational shorting? What are the consequences of operational shorting on liquidity provision? They're allowed to do this specifically because they're bona fide market making. It's supposed to enhance liquidity for those of us who are buying and selling in the secondary market. So how does that operational shorting activity relate to future returns? And then last of all, does, thinking about our broader question today about financial instability, you know, does that operational shorting manifest itself as spillover effects or financial linkages? Now, when we think about contagion mechanism that might really matter for a future crisis, I think about three elements in particular. One, do I have any evidence it would spread within a firm? Two, do I have any evidence it would spread between firms? And three, is it magnified by leverage? So we'll look at exactly those issues for operational shorting uh, and its, its behavior. So our data is from March 2004 to 2016. We're looking at US exchange traded funds. There are no levered ETFs in our sample, not because they're not interesting. In fact, the results there are even more dramatic. But we didn't want people to think our results were driven solely by that. So there are no levered ETFs uh, in, in the sa sample here. So there, a subset of our tests are really going to focus on U.S. equity ETFs when we need to compare the bid-ask spread of the underlying assets to the ETF itself. And all of our regressions are going to include date and fixed effects. Right? So about 3 million observations, fails to deliver over that time period on average are about 0.42%. Operational shorting on average is about 1%. Um, and the rest of the sample statistics are there. So first things first, we look to see, do we have the economics right? When we look at operational shorting, what drives that decision to operationally short? First of all, we find, and not surprisingly, that when you have larger creation unit size and larger creation unit fee, so think more expensive to create, then I'm more likely to delay creation. I'll have higher rates of operational shorting when this is the case. Similarly, if I have access to a hedge for the underlying, 
So, and the better that access is, the more likely I am to operationally short. Now, this is not an indication. We're not saying in the paper, by any stretch of the imagination, we think that authorized participants are going into this naked. They'll do this if they have an appropriate hedge to hedge the risk of the change in the value of the underlying. And that's an important determinant about when they do operationally short. We find that you're more likely to operationally short if the underlying is less liquid relative to the ETF. So think higher trading costs in the underlying means I'd rather not mess with the basket. I'd rather resolve all of these issues just in that secondary market buying and selling and with that T plus six delay. Um, you're more likely to do it when the ETF premium is higher. So I've got a bigger arbitrage potential. And when there's high share turnover in the ETF itself. So once again, we're controlling for ETF date fixed effects, liquidity and size, all the other standard controls. We look at this, we feel like our measure is picking up what we think it's picking up. When there's excess demand for the ETF, we're able to capture when authorized participants choose to delay creating the underlying ETF shares. Now, does that relate to the observed short interest FTD numbers? Now, the regressions are really compelling, but I actually think this picture may be just as compelling. What do I have here? The blue line over time is our aggregate daily operational shorting volume. The red dotted line is the average daily FTD volume. And the correlation isn't one to one, but it's very high. Now you might say, well, that's just a picture. What does that mean? If we run the regressions themselves, operational shorting is the single strongest predictor of both short interest levels and failing to deliver for ETFs, even when we control for the borrowing cost or lagged short interest or FTDs. This seems to be a primary component of short interest in FTDs. If I were using short interest FTDs of ETFs as a signal in one of my models, right? You might think this you know, with rebate rate, short interest FTDs, et cetera, this might be a great way to get the market's assessment of a particular industry, asset class, geography. It is important to separate out our measure of operational shorting from directional shorting. And it turns out if you do that, the predictive power is much stronger. Why? There's no directional, as I'll show you in just a minute with the returns, there's really no directional information in operational shorting. So what does the AP think? They think that the trade in the ETF will reverse, but there'll be no predictive power actually for the underlying of this activity. So if I want to sharpen my prediction, I remove operational shorting. I'm left with true directional shorting in the ETF via one of these measures, and I've got a better predictor of people who have an informed opinion on whether or not the market's going down. To test liquidity, um, our tests are all centered around the existing literature on ETFs. And so what is that? Well, I'm going to use this paper by Ben David, Franzoni, and Musawi to give you a sense of how the current literature thinks about this issue. So I can think about the ETF, the NAV. If your understanding was the same as mine was before, that what happens is whenever there's a discrepancy, there's always trading in the ETF and the underlying, the pictures I'm about to show you make great sense. But what we're going to measure is when these two things are disconnected. Okay, so this Ben David Franzini Mazawi paper say, okay, there's an initial equilibrium. The net asset value of the ETF are both at this fundamental value of the underlying security, asset class, whatever it happens to be. Let's assume there's a liquidity shock to the ETF. A bunch of flows into the ETF. So the ETF price gets pushed upwards. Now, if you were to then look at this arbitrage, buy the underlying basket, you know, create the ETF, share, share those, what will happen? Well, you'll have that shock propagated to the underlying as well. Effectively, I'll wind up with excess volatility in the underlying security just because there's trading in the ETF. ETF gets out of whack, and so that creates trading and volatility until ultimately both of them converge back to that fundamental value. Now, much of the literature really thinks about this concrete, almost mechanical connection between arbitrage and trading in both. Now, over our sample period, a dollar of trading in the ETF only translates to about nine cents of trading in the underlying. The vast majority of trades occur just in the ETF with no connection to the NAV, and operational shorting is a way to measure that. So what happens when we do the same test, controlling for that but accounting for operational shorting? They provide compelling evidence that ETFs do increase volatility via this mechanism, but we find that operational shorting acts as a buffer with that underlying basket of securities. It reduces the negative effect of ETFs on the volatility of the basket because it disconnects the two. It reduces the negative effects of ETFs on intraday spreads of the basket because it disconnects the two. And the last one was actually the least economically intuitive for me. I just assumed the cost of this activity would be decreased price 
informativeness in the underlying asset. And we actually find the exact opposite. That disconnection allows the underlying asset to be more price informed, think less noise trading as it were. And so it seems like, especially in those ETFs where the ETF is much more liquid than the underlying, we have a migration of liquidity traders, noise traders, however you want to think about those individuals to the ETF, which actually can enhance the in price efficiency of the underlying assets themselves. That's one way to look at that argument. Another is to look at the return effects themselves. And so if we use this week's, remember they have T plus six in order uh, to, uh, T plus six to delay. If I use this week's operational shorting and see how it relates to current returns and next week returns, what do we find? Well, first we find a strong positive relationship this week. Contemporaneously, if there's a lot of operational shorting, not surprisingly, the return's going up in the ETF, right? There's excess demand for this ETF. We're operationally shorting as a result. But what does it tell us about the following week? Well, operational shorting today tells us that the ETF price will reverse the next week, meaning these trades that came in this week must have been liquidity traders or noise traders, right? Because that return reverses. How does it relate to the underlying? Actually, there's no predictive power for the underlying at all. Operational shorting tells me that the AP thinks there will be a reversal in this ETF trade, but it doesn't give me any information about the underlying. So if I remove this effect from broader short selling measures, I get much stronger predictions from those short selling measures about future returns because this is just masking. It's just noise, at least for the underlying. We find this to be strongest when we find it to be strongest in our sample of high liquidity mismatch. So these are the ETFs where the ETF is much more liquid than the underlying is. So imagine those noise liquidity traders have all migrated to the ETF itself. They trade there and the predictive power comes from that point. So the AP anticipates that. They don't create the underlying because they think that trade's going to reverse. It's not actually informed or indicative of information. And sure enough, they find out there is a reversal, at least a partial reversal going forward. Now, so far, I think, at least for me, as I, we went to the paper, this all seemed very positive in terms of information. Right? This all seems like maybe this operational shorting thing is a good idea. There's a caveat there, and I think it's important to make that caveat clear. I can't study the caveat as well as I can the first part, so I'm going to have to use an example and give you, you know, the best, my best estimate of uh, how this works. So this is an example. We found this in SEC as we were researching this, trying to figure out how this works, and in a response letter to the SEC, this is an example of an ETF called XRT. XRT is, as probably many of you know, is a consumer retail ETF. So if you have an opinion about consumer retail with the advent of Amazon, it's going up, it's going down, parts of it are going up, going down, this would be a place to manifest that opinion. So what we see, if we look at the shares outstanding, the actual shares created, Three different points in time here, December 2011, March 31st, 2012, June 30th, 11 million, you know, almost 13 million, 9.5 million shares of this ETF. At the same time, we can go to the 13F data and see, okay, for 13F institutions, how many shares of this ETF are being held? Well, over those same time periods, there were 77 million shares held, 75 million shares held, and 64 million shares held. And so you think, well, how is that even possible? There's only 11 million shares, but either operational shorting or rehypothecation of those shares means they have been given again and again and again. This is an extreme right tail event in the distribution. This is not common for all ETFs. That's important to understand. But there are examples. In fact, it's about 15% of our sample where the 13F filings are larger than the shares outstanding. There's more shares being held, at, and this is just the 13F institutions. There may be others holding them as well. Okay, so operational shorting or has been lent out again and again, is that a risk? I worry, and here's my concern, and granted it's one extreme event, I worry in a down market how when you've got 77 million claims on the underlying assets, only 11 million shares worth of those assets at a custodian bank, that the other 66 million shares worth of claims can be properly processed in an orderly way to the individual who owns those 77 million shares. Okay, so that's the concern. Now, like I said, this is the worst example I could find. I'm giving you the far right tail of the distribution. You should never make a decision from the far right tail of the distribution, but it is instructive that it exists, and it's not just one ETF. Like I said, about 10 to 15% of our sample 
you find that uh, you know, there's more than 100% of the shares owned by 13F institutions. And that's not counting other people who own them as well. Okay, I'm almost out of time, so last, uh, last slide here. So we uh, then look at this activity for those three measures that I worry about for contagion. One, is there a mechanism for it to transmit within the AP? And sure enough, we find if an AP is doing operational shorting in one ETF, they're more likely to be operational shorting in the other ETFs they make markets for, so within firm. Two, we find that if one AP, like if in aggregate other APs are operationally shorting, it increases the probability that a given AP, excluded from that number, is also operational shorting. So between firms. And last of all, we find, looking at these regulatory leverage constraints, APs are more likely to operationally short the closer they get to their regulatory leverage limits at the end of the day. I'm not saying the end of the world is coming and this is it, but at the same time, I'm thinking as we consider future crises, this mechanism, which does enhance liquidity in good times, is something we should at a minimum consider. Right? Are we okay with this behavior? How do we make sure things in a bad event are ordered pro you know, properly, et cetera, et cetera. Basically, we think operational shorting is important to understand FTD's short interest. It may be important for you to interpret those signals as quants. We also think it's important in thinking about how the system settles in an extreme event. So thank you so much. I just want to ask a question. Would you comment on the XIV, uh, hmm. the collapse of it? And also, I have been giving hard time ETF up PMs, you know, I want them to ensure me ETF is not the next reason to trigger a financial crisis, <laughs> and they swear on everything they say it's not. So please. Yeah. No, that's a great question. It's a great question. So I, part of the reason in the early version of this paper we had the levered ETFs in because and they were the results are actually stronger in a variety of ways. However. There's a number of things going on in those ETFs, so think ETNs, levered, et cetera, that it was hard for us to tease out the effects. And so we abandoned them not because they're not interesting. I think they are. In fact, they may be more concerning than these, but we wanted to show this in a plain vanilla setting where you could really isolate these effects and say, well, it's not driven by how you're actually constructing the basket, et cetera, et cetera. So I, unfortunately, I, I, with the current results of the paper, and I'm someone who doesn't like to blather on about things I don't understand, I cannot answer your question. So great question, but I got nothing for you. Your paper had the numbers in aggregate. Is there operational short in, in spies, or is it more the unique XRT and similar Similar index. Yeah, great question. So it exists everywhere, but you, you, when you look at the determinants of operational shorting, one of the most important determinants is that the underlying is less liquid than the ETF itself. Now, we're not looking at the most, in fact, for many of our tests, we're looking at U.S. equity ETFs invested in U.S. equities. And so when we say, you know, it's, it's a relative difference, the underlying is still pretty relative, it's still, you know, pretty liquid, all things considered. However, the effect is concentrated when the underlying is less liquid than the ETF itself. So it exists everywhere, but it's more important for those where the underlying is less liquid. Thank you for presenting this because it's totally new to me and very educational. But wouldn't shorting of any kind, whether it's operation or fundamental, be a latent buying power and wouldn't it not that be a positive in a financial crisis? If, if I owe shares, right, and the ETF price collapses, then it's easier to buy those shares back, right? It shouldn't be an issue at that point. So I think that's less of the concern and more in a case like XRT, which I showed, where I've got 77 million shares owned by others, 11 million of assets that are explicitly at a custodian bank, and the other 66 million are somewhere else. You know, how much of that is operational shorting? How much of that actually is you know, lent? And, and what is the collateral backing all of those? So you're right. In general, if my financial, my balance sheet stays solid as the market goes way down, I just made it easier. In fact, in many ways, that's what's happening with the APs. They're expecting, and they, we even find predictive power. I operationally short today because I expect a reversal in the ETF, not in the underlying, not the NAV, but I have to have enough cash, collateral, capital, et cetera, over that period of time to make good on that promise to buy those ETF shares. So it's not as mechanical as maybe, and I hope I didn't suggest that it was. It's more broad about how do you process through who owns 
what to whom. Especially when the individuals, I would guess most retail investors, would think I own an index fund, I own an ETF share, for all intents and purposes, settlement, clearing, etc., is the same between them. But if, if one of those shares was XRT, it's not. It's different. So I applaud you on your work. I know this uh, area pretty well. I know a couple of your co-authors. When I think of the explosion of ETFs, the number of them, the flavors that we're going no. deep, we're getting deeper Absolutely. into the factor exposure framework. I'm wondering, great work. I'm thinking of your next, your, you know, you're adding to this. Um, you know, is this a function of an asset class? Is it yeah, a function yeah. of concentration? Yeah. Is it a function of how deep you're going into the, into the mid cap, small cap, nano cap? Is it a function of geography? Is it really impossible to do this stuff in Russia? Yeah. So what are your comments on where you might take this, whether it be an asset class, liquidity, a Herfindahl index kind of measure, or likewise? No, absolutely. In fact, that's exactly what we're thinking about. Now, you can get some back of the envelope sense today. So the Investment Company Institute has their fact book, which they publish every single year, and they'll show you kind of the difference between secondary and primary market trading. And so if they do it in aggregate, and I think it's, the numbers are very similar to ours, right? For every dollar traded in the secondary market corresponds to about nine cents of trading in the underlying. But there's quite a bit of variation across different geographies, asset classes, industries. And so we're actually working on a follow-up that looks at that. But there's, there are lots of ways to go. And so I'm always curious, I mean, what would be most interesting to you? What should we do with that? So we have results that go a, a host of different directions, including you know, voting of these securities. You know, I've got 77 million that are owned, and yet there's only 11 million of those XRT shares that are associated with voting. So there's 66 million now that have economic ownership, but no voting ownership as well. So it, there, there are a host of things to do. So maybe we could talk after it. I'd be curious to see specifically what questions you want answered, because we, we, there's lots of things we can do, and it's, it's a great idea. Does your research apply to other instruments, for example, closed-end funds, which have similar market NAV imbalances? It's yeah. a smaller market, but... No, no, great question. I, it really is particular to this underlying liquidity mechanism, which is so innovative, right? APs existing there, seeing these arbitrages, and having this really natural incentive to step in and create those two. So closed-end funds, I can't imagine a scenario unless you open-end the fund and then closed-end it in or something, but I just don't think that happens enough. I, I really don't think it would apply to closed-end funds, but good question. The conference is yep. focusing uh, explicitly on crises, past, future, sensitivity, fragility. You referred to it in the presentation. You've had flash crashes, micro crashes, market movement during your time period. Yeah. What do you explicitly see? Think about the flash crash, right? August uh, 24th, right? Is that what was the date? 24th. So you, you look at um, something like Guggenheim had an equal weighted S&P 500 ETF and they had SPY, right? Now, days before, days after, I mean, these aren't exactly the same underlying, but they're comparable in many ways. In fact, the correlation, days before, days after, look basically the same. Right? So that morning, SPY is down about 9%. The Guggenheim ETF is down about 35 40%. And so, you know, what actually drives that? Was it operational shorting on that particular day, et cetera? The problem is, we've had such a good period of market. So the rise of ETF has corresponded to one of the most incredible bull market periods that you know, we've ever seen. And so, it sounds horrible, and, and maybe I should knock on wood or something when I say this, but as an academic, I have a bit of a hedge against down markets that maybe you as quants don't have. Because when markets go haywire, I think, awesome, good experiment. And I can see where things are going to happen and when all of a sudden what's going to happen to these products. But, you know, we just haven't had that many. And I think actually the few blips we've had over the past are not enough to really test it in a systematic way. I mean, it's one thing to fail to deliver in an individual security. I have a hard time thinking for a single stock how that, you know, that shock is perpetrated throughout the rest of the market. For an ETF, this is an asset class, right? And the AP is managing you know, ETFs, other, other asset classes and geographies. So the mechanism, potential mechanism for contagion of such a shock here is much clearer than it is, I think, for FTDs and regular securities. And that's the other concern. Yeah. Okay. I'm a little bit more familiar with fixed income markets. And there you can have this sort of daisy chain of fails, which then make a participant less willing to actually go ahead and short sell or to lend if they have a security because they're you know, anticipating perhaps they're not actually going to be able to fulfill the trade. Um, but what I was wondering was more how this functions in a fixed income or a bond yeah. ETF. 
Yeah. Um, the settlement <laughs> conventions are different. That was exactly what you were going to ask. <laughs> uh, so there's a shorter settlement cycle. And I was also noticing when you pointed out that date of the um, SEC penalty rule, um, that that occurred right around the same time as the fails penalty in uh, treasuries, mm -hmm. um, which I think, I'm not sure if it's gone in for MBS as well. Do you know? That I don't know. That's that's that, that was sort of talk in the background. And that's the Fed, not the SEC, obviously. Yeah. So two very different things, but they seem to be kind of timing similar. Um, and there are different implications and costs, I guess, um, with that as well. And I know right after the penalty went into effect, there was a period that you saw basically no fails. Yeah. Uh, and people anticipated that that would persist, especially given that the implicit penalty then was about you know two and a half percent with rates at zero. And it, instead, there actually have been spikes in fails. And so mm -hmm. I wonder if perhaps something like this could help to explain that. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. So we, my understanding is for ETFs, the fixed income ETFs, these same rules apply, but those fail rules would apply to the underlying itself. And if you look at the, across fixed income funds, for example, a dollar of trading translates into about 18 cents of trading in the underlying. So there's actually a tighter connection, even though you'd think of that underlying as being less liquid, like I'd want to do more operational shorting as opposed, but you find that you know, a dollar of trading in the secondary market translates to even more trading of the underlying for the fixed income ETFs in our sample. And I think that may be part of the reason why. 